The Comedy by Dante Alighieri Translated and read by Leon Stevens Hell, Canto One. Halfway along the road of our life I came to my senses in a dark forest which had the unerring way overgrown. And what a hard thing tis to tell what was that brutal and crabbed and choked forest, for in mere thought the fear revives. It is so bitter death is little more. But to divulge the good which there I found, I shall speak of all else I noted there. I am dumb to tell how I came therein. I was so sleep-filled at that instant when I forsook the way of truth. But as I came to the foot of a hill, there at the far reach of that valley which had with fear my heart transfixed, I looked up and saw its shoulders robed in the rays of the planet that leads us straight on every track. The fear then was a little calmed which in my heart's lake had hardened through the night I spent in anguish. And as one who has with labored breath escaped from ocean deep to shore, turns to the perilous water and stares, so my soul, which was fleeing still, turned behind to view again that pitfall which never yet yielded living man. When, my racked body a little rested, I set off again on the naked hillside, so the firm foot was ever lower. Yea, behold, almost where the steep began, a leopard, light and wonderful, swift, and covered in a spotted hide, and she refused to leave my sight. Nay, she so much hindered my road, I turned many times to retreat. It was the hour of morning's assumption, as the sun was mounting up with those stars which accompanied him when divine love first set in motion those beautiful things. So the many-colored fur of that beast, the hour of the day, and the sweet season gave me motive to hope for my good. Yet I was struck with fear by the sight of a lion that toward me arose. He appeared to attack me with head held high, and with such rabid hunger it seemed the air thereof was craven. And a wolf which appeared laden with all cravings in her gaunt frame, and hath made many live heartsick. She burdened me so with heaviness by the fear that from her mean issued, I lost all hope of the mountain crest. And as is he who greedily reaps, and comes the time when he must lose, that he weeps and sighs in his every thought, such the restless beast made of me as she bore down, little by little driving me back to where the sun is mute. Then, as I went stumbling below, unto my sight was offered me one who seemed hoarse from long silence. When I saw him on the waste's expanse, Have mercy on me, I cried to him. Whatever thou be, shade or true man, he answered. Not man. I once was man, and my mother and father were Lombards, both of them natives of Mantua. I was born Subulio, though late in the day, and lived in Rome under good Augustus in the time of false and lying gods. I was a poet, and sang of that just son of Anchises who came from Troy after haughty Ilium was burnt to ash. But why revertest thou to such despair? Why climbst not to the mountain of delight which is motive and source of every joy? Then art thou that Virgilius and that spring who pourst out so broad a stream of speech? I answered him with humbled brow, O light and honor of the other poets, may my long study and the great love avail me that made me peruse thy work. Thou art my master and my mover, thou art he alone from whom I took the fair style that hath won me honor. Thou seest the beast from which I turned, deliver me from her, renowned sage, for she makes me tremble in vain and pulse. Thou must fix on another course, he answered when he saw me weep if thou wouldst flee this wilderness, for this beast which maketh thee cry allows no other tread her way, but hinders him till she kills him, and her nature is so malign and base that she never sates her craving will, and after eating's more famished than before. The animals she mates with are many, and shall be more yet till the hound comes who'll make her die in agony. He will not feed on land or pewter, but wisdom, love, and righteousness, and bounds be between Feltro and Feltro. He will be saviour to humbled Italy, for which chaste Camilla, Evrialus, and Turnus, and Nisus died of wounds. He will pursue her through every town until he dispatcheth her to hell, whence primal envy unkennelled her. Therefore I judge of thy good and counsel, follow thou me, and I shall be thy guide, and lead thee hence to an eternal realm, where thou shalt hear the desperate screams, shalt see the ancient spirits in their pain, each crying out at second death, and then shalt see the ones contented in the fire, because they hope to come, whenever it be, among the blessed. To whom, if then thou wouldst ascend, a worthier soul than I will come, I shall leave thee with her at my parting. 
For that emperor who there above commands, because I was rebellious against his law, wills that his city be not by me entered. There in all quarters he rules and reigns, there is his city and the lofty throne, O joyous whom he welcomes in! And I to him, Poet, I entreat thee in that God's name whom thou didst never know, so I may flee this wickedness and worse lead me there whereof now thou hast spoke, so that I may see St. Peter's gate and those thou reportest so cheerless. Then he moved on and I kept behind. Canto three. By me the way to the pain-filled city, by me the way to eternal torment, by me the way among the lost people. Justice moved my sublime creator, I was by divine power created, most highest wisdom and primal love. Before me no other things were made if not eternal, and eternal I remain. Abandon all hope, ye who enter. I saw these words of darkest hue inscribed above a gate. Thus I, Master to me their sense is hard. And he to me, as a learned person, Here befits thee leave all trepidation, Here it befits that all cowardice die. We are come to the place where I said thou should see the pain-stricken people who have lost the good of intellect. And when he had put his hand on mine with a glad look which gave me comfort, he led me within to secret things. Their sighing, mourning, and deep laments resonated through the starless air, so that therefore at the first I wept. Monstrous tongues, hideous modes of speech, words of pain, accents of ire, rasping fierce voices, and sound of hands withal, created a tumult that revolves forever in that timeless air, dark as the sand that spinneth in whirlwinds. And I, my head ringed with misgiving, said, Master, what is that I hear, and what people who seem so crushed by pain? And he to me, this wretched manner belongs to the dreary souls of those who lived without blame and without praise. They are mixed with that malicious choir of angels who were nor rebellious nor faithful to God but lived for self. Heaven rejects them to save its beauty, nor doth the deep abyss grant them entry, for the evil would glory over them. And I, Master, what burdens them so that makes them lament so bitterly? He said, I shall tell thee most briefly. These are lacking the hope of death, and this their blind life is so base they envy all other fortunes. The world forbiddeth them all fame, clemency and justice disdain them. Let us speak not of them, but look and pass. And I who looked round saw an ensign which twisting raced on with such swiftness it seemed unworthy of all repose, and behind it came so long a train of people that I would not have believed that death had undone so many. When I had recognized some among them, I saw and distinguished the shade of him who cowardly made the great refusal. I instantly conceived and was right sure that this was the faction of wretches abhorrent to God and to his enemies. Those depraved souls who never lived walked naked, stung repeatedly by wasps and hornets swarming there. They made their faces stream with blood which at their feet mingled with tears was collected by loathsome worms. And when I cast my sight farther, I saw people at the bank of a wide river, so that I said, Master, now permit me to know what they are, and what compulsion makes them seem so anxious for the crossing, as I estimate by this muted light. And he to me, Let these things be told thee, when we have brought to rest our steps on the rotted strand of Acheron. Now with eyes ashamed and fallen, fearing my words had offended him, as far as the river I held my peace. And behold, coming toward us in a boat, an old man, white with ancient hair, shrieking, Woe to ye, corrupted souls! Never hope to see the vault of heaven! I come to bring you to the other bank, into eternal shadows, fire and ice. And thou, who standest there, living soul, move away from those who are dead! But when he saw I did not move away, he said, By other ways, by other ports shalt come to shore, not passing hence. A lighter vessel must carry thee. And my leader to him, Caron, rage not, thus is it willed, there where is empowered what is willed, and ask no further. Here were quieted the bristling cheeks of the helmsman of the lurid swamp, about whose eyes revolved wheels of flame. But those souls who were weary and naked, altered color and grinded their teeth as soon as they grasped the cruel words, execrated God and reviled their parents, humankind, and the place, and the time, and the seed of their engendering, and of their birth. Then all of them gathered together, wailing loudly by the wicked shore that waits every man who fears not God. Demonic Caron, with ember eyes, beckoning to them, gathers them all. He clubs with the oar whoever lags. 
as in autumn the leaves dissever one after another till the bough seize upon the earth all its treasure in like manner the bad seed of adam leap from that embankment one by one at signals as a falcon at his recall thus they depart o'er the darkened wave and before they are there disembarked here once again a new crowd collects dear my son said the courteous master those who die in the wrath of god all assemble here from every land and they are prepared to ford the flood because heaven's justice goads them on so that fear resolveth to desire never do sound souls pass this way and therefore if charon complains of thee now shouldst know well what his words purport this ended the benighted country trembled with such force the memory of its terrors still bathed me in sweat the tear-soaked ground gave forth a wind that emitted a crimson light which overwhelmed my every sense and i fell as one seized by sleep canto v thus i descended from the first circle to the second which rings a lesser space and such greater pain it pricks to howling there stands minos horribly he snarls at the portal he inspects the guilty judges and consigns according as he girds i mean that when the ill-born soul comes before him it confesses all and that connoisseur of sinful actions sees which place in hell befits it his tail encircles him as many times as grades he wishes it be sent down they stand before him always many they go by turns each to judgment they speak and hear and then are cast below o thou who comest to the painful lodgings said minos to me when he saw me leaving the exercise of such duty look how thou enter and in whom thou trust let the width of entry not deceive thee and my leader to him why this shouting hinder not his destined passage thus is it willed where is empowered what is willed and ask no further now the doleful tones commence to make themselves heard to me now i am come where a mighty plaining assails me I come to a place all of muted light, of howling as a sea in tempest makes when she's embattled by opposing winds. The infernal gale, never in repose, compels the spirits with its savagery, twisting and thrashing it belabors them. When they arrive before the ruin, there the screams, the plaints, the lamentations, there they revile the holy power. I learn that to tortures thus contrived are condemned the sinners of the flesh who make reason the thrall of passion and as starlings' wings bear them forth in time of cold in broad-bunched flocks, so that gale the wicked spirits. Up, down, hither, hence it drives them. No hope ever gives them comfort, nor of repose, nor lesser pain. And as cranes go singing their lays, forming long-drawn chains in the air, thus I saw spirits come wailing, borne by the fearful hurricane. So I said, Master, who are those folk the black air punishes so? the first of those whose fortunes thou wouldst know he then answered was empress over many languages she was so given to the vice of lust she made lechery licit in her law to quash the reproof to which she was led she is semiramis of whom we read that she succeeded ninos and was his wife she possessed the land the sultan rules next is she who slew herself for love and broke faith with the ashes of sicaeus then cometh licentious cleopatra I saw Helene, for whom such a long time of evil elapsed, and saw great Achilles, who in the end fell foul of love. I saw Paris, Tristan, and he pointed out and named more than a thousand shades whom love had severed from our life. After I had heard the learned man name the ancient ladies and cavaliers, pity vanquished me, and I was near undone. I commenced, poet, willingly would I converse with those two who come entwined and appear to be so light before the wind and he to me thou shalt see when they are nearer us and do thou then entreat them by that love which leads them and they will come as soon as the wind bends them toward us i raised my voice o persecuted souls come speak with us and another not forfend like as doves commanded by desire with wings raised and fixed to the sweet nest come over the air borne by their will thus they broke from dido's squadron coming to us through the foul air so forceful was the loving cry o living being gracious and kind who through the purse air comes visiting us who stained the world red with our blood if the universal king were our friend we should pray him accord thee peace who takes pity on our twisted state of what pleaseth you listen and speak we shall listen and shall speak with you while the wind as now here is silent the city where i was born sitteth above the seashore where po descends with his tributaries to have peace love which kindles swiftly in gentle hearts seized this man with the beautiful body i was robbed of and the means still galls us 
Love which excuses none love from loving seized me so hard with this man's enchantment that still he attends on me as thou seest. Love conducted us to a single death. Cain awaits him who extinguished our life. These words from them unto us were born. When I understood those injured souls, I bowed my sight and long held it low till the poet said, What thinkest thou? When I answered, I began, O oh, alas, how many sweet thoughts, how great the desire which led these two to the grievous travail. Then I turned to them again, and I spoke, and I began, Francesca, thy sufferings bid me mournfully and tenderly weep. But tell me, in the time of sweet sighing, by what and how did love allow you to know your hesitant desires? And she to me, There is no greater pain than in dejection to recall a time of happiness, and this thy teacher knows. But if the first root of our love to can thou hast such deep desire, I'll tell as one who weeps and tells. We were reading one day for pleasure of Launcelot how love compelled him. We were alone and free of misdoubt. Many times that reading lured our eyes together and made us blanch, but that which conquered was a single passage. When we read of her desired smile being kissed by such a lover, he who will never from me be sundered, all trembling kissed my mouth with his. The book was a pander, and he who wrote it, therein that day we read no more. While the one spirit uttered these words, the other wept. So in compassion I fainted as if in my death throes, and I fell as a dead body falls.